A lot of good stuff in this chapter. And you know that this is kind of wrapping up the end of this letter, the second letter, I guess, to Timothy, which was just a helper uh, that, that Paul had with him. He, he helped him do a lot of things. He was a servant. It's kind of a unique situation, what Luke, and, I mean, yeah, Luke and Titus and Timothy, these guys, uh, I don't know their whole story, their whole background, but it seems like they were like these assistants to assistants to uh, to Paul, who was an apostle. So like that exact position doesn't exist quite like, you know, because we don't really have apostles today, so we don't have that. But we do have guys who are, you know, gearing up for the ministry, they're helpers. They want to do whatever the Lord would have them do. They want to do what the pastor, the jobs the pastor would give them to do. And I think of them a lot. And I have used the phrase before I preached the message on it. Had a, for a while a, a, um, a website by this name, The Second Man. And I've used that phrase before. And some people have gotten offended like, oh, I, I hate that term, The Second Man. And, you know, I understand where they're coming from because that like maybe puts the pastor up on a pedestal saying, hey, he's the first man or whatever. But no, obviously, we all have to have that attitude of being the second man. And actually, the point I usually make is that the pastor should be somebody who's gone through that stage of being a second man and knowing how to serve and knowing how to. uh, and And it's not like he's some super, you know, just wonderful person that's now the pastor but the idea is hey he is the one in charge and all the other all the other people who who are helping in the ministry are like second men it's not really a, an offensive term in fact i would think the only ones that would get offended by that are the ones that want to be the first man <laughs> you know why would you be offended by being called the second man you know and uh but the idea is he's got these guys that he's that he's teaching up in the ministry and he's training them and they're preaching. They're carrying out some of the jobs he's called them to do, even to the extent of ordaining elders. He's given them that that, uh, uh, authority to do that. And so 2 Timothy here, he's kind of giving his last words to Timothy. And you see a lot of, at the very end, he's just like jumbling it up together. Oh, don't forget to salute so-and-so. Hey, don't forget to bring me my cloak. It's kind of cold here in prison, you know, and, and, and bring me the parchments. I want to have something to read. I want to have some study material, you know, and he's just kind of giving them all these last things. So we're, we know that we're reading some of the last uh, words, at least what he thinks could be his last words to Timothy. And uh, one of the big things that we see here is this theme is he's telling them to preach. Right. And uh, verse two says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And so obviously he's giving him some tips here or some some commands when it comes to preaching the word. Now, what does preaching the word mean? And the title of the message, in fact, is how to preach the word. Okay, And I'm not going to give an instruction about the details of creating a message or how to pre- preach like that. I guess another, a, a better title would probably be like ways in which to preach the word. Okay. Ways to preach the word. And I'll tell you where the background, a little bit of the background here. Here's, here's why I came up with this idea. I didn't quite know what I was going to preach today when we went to Illinois and in Illinois, I had the opportunity to preach. And when you preach in a guest church i mean you're a guest at a, at a church uh that's not your the church you're familiar with you kind of you you might act or behave a little differently there than you would at home you know and if, and you know quite honestly i might act a little differently preach a different a little differently here in in uh kansas city than i would in iola and when we're out knocking doors we're going to preach a little differently at the door to those people than we would to each other in a church or if I was preaching to a group of people who had been rebellious and been living in sin and all that, I'm going to preach different to them than I would, you know, just preaching to the folks that I don't know anything about. And so uh, that really just kind of came into my mind after I preached because the comment was made after I preached Sunday morning in Illinois that, uh, that man, you know, that was like a comedy routine. I think you said that, right? And, and I, don't, I, I took that as a compliment, right? He said, this is like a comedy routine. He was just rolling with the jokes and all that kind of stuff. And quite honestly, I didn't even know like I was being funny. But that was just my breaking the ice, my trying to like get people to listen to me and like me when I'm in a strange place where I don't know. You just kind of do that. And I thought about that actually after I even heard that comment about the comedy 
a comedy show, like, was I too silly? As is in my mind. I, after I'm done preaching, I always think through things. And my wife sometimes, like, you need to quit thinking about it. But uh, I start thinking, was I too silly? Did I say the wrong thing here? Did I? When I'm preaching, I don't really think that much about it. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't dwell on it, at least. But afterwards, I kind of replay everything in my mind. If you've preached here, you probably feel that same thing after you're done. Like, how did they take this or whatever? And so I looked on the YouTube channel after I preached, and somebody's comment was, Pastor, Pastor Randall's funny. I thought, I don't think of myself as a real funny guy. You know, I don't think I'm funny when I preach most of the time. And so, you know, I'm thinking, well, okay. I mean, obviously I was maybe being a little silly or something like that. And then I started getting a little bit self-conscious. Like, was I too silly? Come on, I don't want to, preaching should never be a circus show or something like that. And then I get on Facebook later on in the night and I'm just going down. And somebody posts, I, I'm hoping it's unrelated. I think it's unrelated. Totally coincidence, okay? I think the guy was from Illinois, but that's beyond the... <laughs> That's another matter. He wasn't like a member of the church out there that I preached at, but I think he lives in that area or something. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, okay? But he posts this post and he says, we shouldn't go to church for a comedy routine. We should go to church. And I don't know, he said something. About, but the weird thing was in his, his post was actually a gospel presentation you probably many in here, your soul winners, you've probably seen it where Pastor Anderson is demonstrating how to preach the gospel and he knocks on someone's door. It's like an old video. And he's knocking on someone's door and he's presenting the gospel to them. And that was the the post that he made, but the comment on there was, We don't go to church for a comedy comedy routine. We go to I I don't remember what the rest of it was. But I'm thinking, well, actually we don't go to church to preach the gospel. People in church should be saved already, <laughs> right? I'm so inside. I'm not sure why he used this. In fact, that afternoon, as a church, we went out soul winning. And guess what? I used that pretty much that same presentation that that guy showed. And again, I'm not. I don't know that he was ref referencing me. I was just being critical of myself and think and reading everything that way. But in my mind, I'm just playing that out, and I'm thinking, well, I did go and preach the gospel just like this presentation. You know, I think probably is very similar presentation. I didn't watch it again, but I'm pretty sure that that was the case. And somebody got saved, right? And then I'm thinking like, I wonder what mo does, don't most people preach a little differently at someone else's church than they do at home? Again, this is just me, my mind. This is how I, how I work. Okay. This is welcome to a day inside my mind. Okay. And so then somewhere in the travels, I had downloaded some different messages and I was listening to some messages and I came across a message where Bruce Mejia was at Faithful Word and he was preaching and guess what he was doing? Cracking jokes. <laughs> so I'm like, that's normal. What you do, you're just trying to break the ice and you're being a little funny. And, uh, and so, but I thought about that and I kind of got a little, you know, uh, just thinking about how we preach the word. What does that mean? Preaching the word. And so I wanted to look up in the Bible the different times where it talks about preaching the word and uh, or uses that. And of course, there's a lot of times that preaching is used, but the actual phrase preach the word isn't used all that many times. But I started thinking about that. And then, of course, I listened to Brother David's message on Sunday here, and he was preaching a very practical message, very helpful. A while back, I had talked about the subject of, of remembering people's names. And he preached a message on that. And it was very good. He made It was a good application to us, but it was biblical. And he brought out some principles there. And it was helpful. Now, if he was knocking on somebody's door and preached that, that wouldn't have made any sense because he's there to preach the gospel. He wouldn't be preaching that kind of a thing. And if he's standing here to a group of folks that are saved and go out soul winning all the time and he's preaching the gospel, how to get saved, that wouldn't really make a lot of sense. you know. And so there, there, there are some things to think about. In that. So I want to look at three points here, pretty much from 2 Timothy 4 uh, is, is where I get some of the idea here, but three different ways in which we preach the word. Okay. First of all, we already read, uh, uh, we already read number, verse 2, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Actually, I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, the first one, look at verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. The first way in which we preach the gospel, I mean, in which we preach the word is preaching the gospel. 
Okay, a lot of times the Bible talks about preaching the word. That's exactly what it's saying. Preaching the word of God, the gospel. We know gospel means good news, okay, or uh, or glad tidings. In fact, you can you can prove that. I don't have it written down in my notes, but you can prove that because when Jesus says he quotes Isaiah and he says you're supposed to, he said uh, unto me it's given to preach. Uh, preach the gospel to the poor. I'm totally butchering that, but I don't remember the exact uh, reference. But if you go back to Isaiah, where he's quoting, instead of saying preach the gospel, it says preach glad tidings. Okay, because this means the same thing. Good, the good news. You can break down the word God spell, and that's what it's saying. It's the good news. So when we go preach the gospel at somebody's door, our job is to bring them good news. Hey. You know, you need to know the bad news before you know the good news. So we always tell them, hey, the Bible says we're all sinners and we all deserve to go to hell. you got to get them to understand that. In fact, I don't know how many have ever had this happen, but you lead somebody in prayer and you say, uh, you know, uh, all right, Father, I, I know I'm a sinner. Father, I know I'm a sinner and I know I deserve to go to hell. And they're like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> Have you ever done that? And you're like, okay, this person doesn't get it. Let me preach the gospel to them again. Now, some people would criticize that, but see, that's the importance, I think, about like making sure at the very end that they're, that they're saying that to you, confessing with the mouth, right? So that, they, so that you understand what's in the heart. Otherwise, we don't know what's in their heart until we get them to actually say that, uh, pray a prayer, or whatever. But what... What we have to let them know is that in their current condition, they're going to die and go to hell. <clears throat> now, does that require me to repro reprove and rebuke, you know, and just get up there and get mad at them and say, you're living in sin, have this sign that says repent or burn, <laughs> you know, turn or burn. You know, does, does preaching good news require that I reprove and rebuke? Not necessarily. I just need to tell them, hey, the Bible says that we're all sinners. You know, you can tell a little kid that who has this much sin in their life because they don't have a life, a long life that they've lived. And you just need to teach them, hey, even telling a lie is a sin. And because you're a sinner, you deserve to go to hell. And once they realize that, hey, guess what? Here's the good news. You don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. God commended his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you can preach them the gospel. You don't have to reprove and re rebuke, okay? But uh, when we do the work of an evangelist, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll explain that word here in a second, what we're doing is we're preaching the gospel. Let me read to you Acts 8, 4. It says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And that was after the uh, Stephen, you know, and the persecution that was going there. And then it says after that they scattered abroad. Who's they? Well, the church. Right, the, the the church that existed at that time. Now it follows some particular stories about Philip, you know, Stephen, as we just read. It follows some preaching of Peter, you know. But if you read what it's saying, who's they? The church. They all went out preaching the word, and what they were doing is the work of an evangelist. Let's turn. Uh, well, let me. I'll just skip that one. Okay, the doing the work of an evangelist. Okay, look at Acts twenty one. Acts 21, verse 8. There's only really two places where the Bible uses evangelist. And one is in our text where it says, do the work of an evangelist. Okay, and then there's this one in Acts 21. Uh, look at verse 8. And the next day, we that were of uh, Paul's company departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Okay, so this is talking about Philip. And two things we know from this text is that Philip was called an evangelist. And then we know also that Philip had daughters. Okay, and, uh, and, so, and we know that he was one of the seven. Three things we know. Okay, what do you mean one of the seven? Well, for the sake of time, I'm just explaining it in a nutshell, but you could look at Acts 6. And in Acts 6, they decided, you know what? 
we have got to commit ourselves entirely to praying and then and, and, and handling the word and, and giving the word ministry of the word. And, and so what we need is some people to take care of some of these secondary issues. And then, so they say, pick out some fr people from among you who are full of the, the Holy Ghost and and uh, good men, honest men. And so they pick seven people. And one of the people in there is Philip. OK, so we know that these people that they picked were uh, at least evangelistic in their in their you know what they do and one was Stephen by the way which we we, re we read about Stephen he goes and preaches the gospel ends up getting stoned and then Philip is an evangelist what's he do well we follow him he goes into Samaria preaching the gospel okay he's doing the work of an evangelist apparently this is something that all of those seven men were supposed to do so it wasn't just like the apostles preach and we'll just handle the finances and do all this kind of stuff. They all preached. But these guys had a special uh, special ministry right, where they had the authority and carried on the work uh, that, their, that the apostles did. But I think another word as we read into Timothy and Titus, another word we'll see what these seven men were was deacons. Okay, because the Bible gives us qualifications of a deacon. It gives the qualifications of a pastor and then a deacon. And guess what? Qualifications of a deacon are almost exactly the same as the qualifications of a pastor. And one of them is that they're married and they have children who are in subjection. Well, we know Philip had children, right? He had these four daughters. And so, uh, and, and they were, they were minist ministers themselves, right? They, uh, they prophesied. And so, uh, so anyway, I just think that's an interesting idea. But this office of an evangelist, and in Ephesians 4.11, the word is used one other time in, a, in the plural form. It says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Okay, so Jesus uh, uh, wanted his church to be full of these types of people who would go out. And so when he tells Timothy here, do the work of an evangelist, what he's saying is go out and preach the gospel. Okay, and, the, and, the, and we can look all through the Bible uh, how we're supposed to preach the gospel. And basically, you know, freely you have been given, freely give. Jesus, his mission was to seek and to save that which is lost. When we're preaching the gospel, we're looking for people who are lost, who know they're lost, who want to hear the good news. And if they don't want to hear the good news, we shake off the dust and we move on. And this is what preaching the gospel is about. But it doesn't necessarily require what might another form of preaching might require, okay? So let me give you another form of preaching. The first one is preach the gospel. Everybody in here is familiar with that. We've got a lot of people who can preach the gospel. Praise the Lord for that. And that is a very important ministry of preaching the word, okay? But the second is what we read in our text where it says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, okay? Now this is right after this, back in 1 Timothy 4, I mean, 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. And he says in verse 2, preach the word. And then he's continuing this on. Be instant and in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. So this is a type of preaching the word, right? That's not necessarily preaching the gospel, but it's saying, hey, whenever somebody... Uh, I think the idea is whenever you see people who are supposed to be Christians, supposed to be saved, and they're living like the world or they're doing something wrong, you're supposed to reprove them, rebuke them, and exhort them. These are the three uh, types uh, or, or, or three uh, what do you call it? Characteristics of preaching the word. All right, not necessarily preaching the gospel, but preaching God's word sometimes requires these three things. Let me break down what they mean real quick. Reprove actually comes from the same word where we get reprobate. I'm talking about just the English word. You follow the etymology of that word, and it's the, from the same place where we get reprobate, which means reject. Okay, and so when we reprove somebody, it's saying we reject what they're saying. We reject what they believe or whatever, and we're letting them know we reject it. Okay, Rebu rebuke, if you study that, the etymology of that word, and, the, and you come to a word that means basically means chopping wood, okay? And so what, whatever that means, that's a harsh thing. Hey, we're, we're chopping the wood. We're laying the axe, okay, to the root, 
and we're we're like just flinging it down and we're saying hey we're not going to tolerate this we're making a we're, we're making a line right here okay so you look that up and it means reprimanding harshly you can look at all the places in the bible where it says that and this is the basic idea where you reprimand somebody harshly okay you reject what they are doing or what they're teaching you reject that and now you're reprimanding them harshly and then the third is exhort and exhortation has to do with thoroughly encouraging somebody, okay? Now, you could encourage somebody. That sounds like the positive because I've always said, okay, with two negatives, one positive, right? And uh, But you can encourage somebody in all manner of different ways. That doesn't mean just like positive only type encouragement, but it's saying, hey, I just reproved you. I just rebuked you, and now I'm going to exhort you and encourage you to do what I just told you is right, you know, or if somebody comes around and they say, hey, you're right. I shouldn't do that. Okay, now let me encourage you. Let me let me uh, give you the what you need and equip you to be able to do what you're supposed to do and encourage you to do that. And this is what preaching is. So preaching isn't just negative, negative, negative and just tell everybody their faults, but it's saying, hey, I know you can do right. Or maybe they are doing right. You can say, hey, keep up the good work. I want to exhort you. I want to say you're doing a good job, right? That's a type as well. But the idea is that there are times where you have to disagree with people and you have to preach hard. Now, obviously, some of us like that kind of preaching. Anybody here likes hard, repro reproving, rebuking type preaching? I do. I like it. I know I'm not that type of preacher most of the time, but I do like that kind of preaching. In fact, let me give you a word. I think that kind of preaching is sometimes entertaining. Entertaining. And not everybody feels that way, but a lot of us do know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm getting kind of bored of this preaching. It's just dry. I need some entertainment. I can't wait for someone to get their head ripped. I want names to be thrown out there. I want someone to fling it down. I want them to make fun of this guy. And, back. and that's the kind of preaching some people are looking for until they're reproving us. <laughs> Once they start stepping on our toes, this is like, whoa, whoa, man, you crossed the line right there. You know, I don't like this kind of preaching. <laughs> right? But you know what? If you're preaching that way to be entertaining, you know, that's not what rebuking is all about, really. It's not supposed to just be entertaining. In fact, you're going to rebuke somebody as a show to entertain everybody. You know, you're probably missing everything that you're, you're trying to accomplish by that. You're probably just throwing out the window. It's counterproductive. A good reprove, a, a proof, a good rebuke should probably be done privately, right? In private, tell that person what they're doing is wrong reprimand them if you have to. Now, hey, there, I'm not saying there's never a time to re re rebuke somebody from the pulpit or rebuke a whole church or whatever. And, and Lord, help me if I ever have to do that to the, this church as a whole, like, hey, I found out some people are teaching some heresy or doing something. I might say, hey, cut the live stream because <laughs> we're about to rebuke some people right here, okay? But we don't want it to be a show. We don't want it to be entertainment, okay? But with the exhort exhortation, you know, uh, uh, you know, that will have a little bit of a different, different attitude behind it. But when we're reproving, rebuking, exhorting, that's a lot different than preaching the gospel, right? When we are preaching the gospel, we don't necessarily need to reprove people and rebuke them strongly. I mean, there might become a, a, a time, you know, where somebody's just living in sin or whatever, and you know they're lost, that you're reproving them or whatever, and you're hoping for the opportunity to preach the gospel to them. But, you know, some people think that that's the only way you're supposed to preach the gospel. Recently on uh, Facebook, I, I posted something uh, negative about lordship salvation. It was a quote from uh, Franklin Graham, and it was just totally like you got to repent of your sins kind of a mentality. And I posted something negative against that. And a guy on there said, you know, he said, I've got some videos I posted from John MacArthur. You need to listen to those because I think you're wrong. And I'm like, I know what John MacArthur teaches, and I think he's wrong. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, uh, and so he, he said back and forth, quoted some scriptures. I said, hey, that's not what those scriptures mean. You're reading that out of context. Oh, but there's got to be a godly sorrow. Well, you can't have a godly sorrow if you're not saved and have the Holy Spirit in you in the, to begin with. That's, that godly sorrow is, is, re, is a reference to save people. They have godly sorrow because they're saved. And so you can't like just preach the sorrow 
before the salvation. Okay, so uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain this to him. Finally, it comes out, and his final answer is this. Well, here's what happened to me. <laughs> and that's where it always goes, okay? Here's what happened to me. I was a little kid, and I went to Sunday school or whatever, and they said, hey, you want to be saved? Say this prayer. So I said a prayer, and nothing in my life changed. So he says, some time went by. Uh, someone else said, hey, have you ever been saved? All you got to do is, is believe in Jesus and say this prayer. And he said, I decided, hey, I'll do it again. And so I got saved. Nothing in my life changed. And so, you know, he, he said that there was, there was no difference, whatever. He says, finally, I ended up in a church as I got older and had made a lot of mistakes. I got in the church. And in the church, the preacher behind the pulpit was preaching hard against sin and hard against hell. I mean, you know, saying you're going to go to hell and, and all this. And he said he gave an altar call and I felt compelled to go forward and I went forward. And he said, after that day, my life changed. And so he said, that's when I was saved. And I thought, man, you got a real problem right here because, you know, you're making your experience and what happened to you the standard and saying everybody else has to go through that same thing that you just went through in order to be saved. And so if you're saying... That's the kind of preaching you need to go around and preach or else nobody's going to get saved. That's a big problem. And I'm not even getting into the Lordship salvation aspect of, of, you know, hey, the repentance of your sin and all that. I'm just saying if you're thinking that everyone needs to do exactly what you do in order to be saved, that's a big, that's a big problem. Hey, I was saved at eight year old, eight year old as an eight year old boy. And here's how it was. And I know for sure I got saved. <laughs> to this day, I have not, I'm not going to say I've never doubted it. That'd probably be a stretch of the truth, but I, I know that that day I got saved, okay? And I was a little kid, and here's what the guy said. Hey, have you ever been saved? No. Well, can I tell you how to know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? And he just told me, and I said, I believe that. And he said, hey, well, why don't we pray? And I prayed, and I knew I was saved. <laughs> I didn't have any weird conviction. You know, afterwards, you know, I remember feeling like, wow, this is great. Like a burden was lifted off of me, but I didn't feel like, oh no, I've got to come to the Lord uh, or else I'm going hey, my knuckles are turning white. You know, I got to go forward and I got to repent of all my sins or else I'm not going to heaven. None of that happened to me, you know, but it would be wrong for me to go around and say, well, everybody has to do just like me. If you didn't just, you know, just get it and say, yes, uh, no emotion, you know, <laughs> you know, that would be wrong. Because everybody's different and everybody's going to receive the, the gospel in different ways. So reprove, rebuke, exhort is different than preaching the gospel. Okay, but then there's another type of preaching that's actually common in the Bible. And that's just teaching or speaking, making a speech, tell, giving a speech, all right, a lecture, if you will. Not my favorite type of preaching, not my favorite type of preaching to listen to, but it is preaching. And the Bible uses that word as preaching. I remember in Bible college, uh, a lot of times preachers would try to make a distinction between preaching and teaching. And I think there's a distinction. Okay, teaching is, is, is giving people facts, helping them to understand something maybe in the Bible, learn something new or whatever. And, uh, and I understand that's not necessarily preaching. Preaching is more like, not so much the focus on giving you the knowledge, but saying, hey, you need to go do this. And it's like a push to get people to do something. So you think about the reprove, rebuke, exhort kind of an idea. I believe those aspects should probably be part, be part of preaching to some extent. But, uh, but you, you, know, you, you can't just necessarily say that all teach, I mean, that, that all preaching has to be this certain style. Sometimes preaching is just talking, right? Now I've, I've been to some some message, some some churches where they're having where the pastor's up there and he's giving a talk, and sometimes we'll make fun of that. I, I've made fun of that before. Hey, he's just getting up there giving a little. He's going to share for a little while. No, don't get up there and share. Preach it. Fling it down. Right. Don't just share. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes the preacher gets up and all he's really needing to do to get the message across and to equip people and to teach them is, is he's just going to share some things from the Bible. Let me share with you what's on my heart or whatever. And look, that might not be exciting. That might not be the entertaining, have the entertaining value, but that is something that needs to be done sometimes. Okay. And I remember listening through after uh, Valerie's grandpa died and he was a good preacher. I mean, as far as the fling it down type preacher, I'm talking about, I mean, both her grandparents were good preachers, but I'm talking about her, Grandpa Fight, who was a missionary. And in his last days, you know, he started kind of having Alzheimer's and he was kind of losing his mind a little bit. But you could see that as you listened, because after he passed away, I listened to a lot of his little tapes. 
Everybody know what tape is? Okay, you've heard all the jokes. <laughs> Had to rewind it with a, with a pencil, I understand. <clears throat> we all know what tapes are. And I'd listen to those tapes and listen to him preaching, and you could kind of tell, like, hey, his preaching is not like it was a couple years before that. Right, but he would go into a church and he they'd have him come uh, uh, present the message, and he'd spend like maybe twenty or thirty minutes rehashing like everything that happened on his on his last trip to Mexico or El Salvador, and he's given all these things. And sometimes he'd go on a little rabbit trail about the politics and the government, and you know, back in those days, I remember uh, in his latter days, Bill Clinton was president, and he always called him Slick Willie. And he was always preaching against Slick, Slick Willie. But, you know, sometimes it was just like this <laughs> long speech, right? And, uh, and then he would tie in like the last five minutes, he'd give a little charge, you know, to the people. Well, when did he preach? Was preaching just that last five minutes that he gave the charge? Or was preaching the entire thing? I think he, the whole time he was up there, he was preaching, okay? Look at uh, Acts chapter 20. I don't really mean for this message to be like defending my style of preaching. That's not the point I'm trying to make. I'm just saying there are different types of preaching, okay? And not one, there's not a one size fits all way of getting the message across. It depends on what the message is, who the audience is, and all that. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. I feel like this was a speech that wasn't all that exciting, <laughs> wasn't all that entertaining. You say, how do you know that? Well, because a guy falls out of a window because he falls asleep. <laughs> and he's preaching until midnight. You think he just preached like just full force, just like letting her rip, like all night long? I don't really know how long he preached, but I mean, he says that he went till midnight. I'm thinking he just had a whole lot to say and a whole lot to share, and he's probably just going through uh, the Bible and he's and he's saying all these these different things, okay? And so, but it says there that he preached. Now I realize it doesn't give me the context or what he preached or how he preached exactly, but the idea is that he that it also uses the word speech, okay? He gave his speech, and it was preaching, and uh, and it didn't necessarily include that I know of. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, although he might have thrown some things in there because if his preaching was anything like his letters, he certainly included some of that, you know, getting on to people for different things he had heard uh, that they had done or whatever. But some of it was probably just preaching and teaching and instructing and saying, hey, I'm going to go on this journey and here's what we need you to do. It probably wasn't all that exciting, as we know by you to kiss falling out of the window. <laughs> okay. So I do think preaching should include, sometimes it's going to include reprove, rebuke, exhort. Uh, you know, sometimes that, that will be part of it. But what is the point? But here's the thing. What good is teaching somebody something or, or spending the time getting up there and preaching something or trying to communicate a message to somebody if they walk away and they didn't get it? Right? So there has to, the job of a preacher whether it's at the door, soul winning. And listen, I know that when we preach the gospel, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. It's not about us being fancy with our speech and crafty. But let's be honest, they've got to receive the gospel. They've got to hear it. They've got to understand it. And so when you're preaching verse after verse and you're giving your presentation and you can tell their eyes are just glazed over and they're just yawning and you ask and you pause for a second because you just asked them a question and they don't know that you just asked them a question and they're like, oh, he paused. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> what was the question again? Have you ever heard that? Have you ever done that? And it's, oh, it's frustrating. Because you're like, man, I don't know when you stopped listening. I don't know when you tuned out. Now I got to go back and say all this over again. But look, if you could add enough interest in there that they actually follow that and they actually receive that teaching, that's going to help out so much. It doesn't mean that you're winning them over with your speech and with your power. You're winning them over with the gospel, but they need to hear the gospel, right? And the same is true when you're reproving and rebuking somebody. Typically, people perk up whenever somebody's getting loud and they're beating the pulpit. You know, unless they just do that the whole message. 
You know, I've been in churches where they people that just that's just their volume that they preach from the moment they get up there to the end. And guess what? I fall, I fell asleep in some of those messages. <laughs> it wasn't the preachers. wasn't It was bad preaching. It was just like, hey, I'm tired and it's just not getting through right now. Okay, but sometimes they would mix it up, and then you know you're just starting to fall asleep, and then you hear, and you're just like, whoop, you know. So I mean, they got they accomplished something. They woke you up probably because they saw me dozing off. That's why they decided to go. And, uh, and they woke me up. And so now I'm able to listen to what they're saying. And when somebody gets up there and, and, and speaks hard against your sin, guess what? You're listening because you're just sitting up straight like, what does a preacher know? <laughs> How does he know that I'm involved in that sin? You know, And you're, you're thinking through all these things. And so, uh, and so there's different ways to do that, but you got to get the message across. So I preached before on how Ezekiel uses object lessons, right? Uh, God told him to use object lessons. So we know using object lessons in a message isn't wrong. And so he would use, you know, chop up hair. Uh, he'd build this, he built this little fort out of clay and, and, and all these, uh, these different pots and stuff like that. And he built a fort and, and, and he used that as an object lesson. And uh, he did weird things that God had told him to do, but they were for, they were for, to communicate a message and to get a point across. And so we use object lessons sometimes, or we use illustration stories. Uh, you know, that's, I'll be honest with you, that's the most effective for me. Okay. Just my way of preaching. I'm not really loud. I don't get super excited sometimes, but I've noticed when I see people kind of starting to trail off and I look at my notes and, and I got an illustration coming up, or maybe I just off the cuff think of an illustration that applies and I start telling a story, I notice people start looking up at me, right? Because it's a, I'm telling a story. And hopefully it's going to be a good story that relays the message I'm trying to, I'm trying to tell. And now they're, they're still with me and they're getting the message, all right? This is a job of preaching the Word. This is part of it, okay? And so I would encourage you to learn some of those, those I don't want to say tricks, okay? techniques when you're at the door preaching the gospel too. Don't just think, hey, no, 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 the power of God unto salvation. We just need to just quote them scripture. Well, guess what? They need to, they can't understand. They need to hear the preaching of the word. Otherwise, we would just give them a Bible and say, here, read this, right? So they need to hear the preaching and the preaching isn't going to do anything for them if they're not actually getting it, okay? So it's not wrong for you to learn how to, you know, keep their attention or, or, you know, maybe get them involved in what you're saying, get them to answer a question back or throw some illustrations in there. Maybe add that as part of your routine when you're preaching the gospel and these things would help when you're teaching the same thing. Object lessons can be really helpful in, in instilling a lesson and getting something in their mind, uh, you know, um, and sometimes telling jokes <laughs> will keep people's attention. Being funny. Now, I agree. You shouldn't be a clown. Uh, I think that men are supposed to be sober, you know, and, and not just be silly and goofy all the time. But there's a time when you can use humor. You can you can be a little funny and people are going to listen to you. They're going to be at ease a little bit. On the, after preaching a message and I told my wife, uh, I always criticize myself after preaching to her and I'm like, did I do too much of this or whatever? She usually already knows what I'm going to ask because she already thought it all through. And she gives me uh, her feedback on it. And I was like, was I too silly? And she says, no. She said, here is what I've noticed about you. When you're around a lot of new people or you're in a new church, uh, a different church to preach, or maybe you got a lot of visitors that day or whatever, that's your way of breaking the ice and setting everybody at ease. And that makes sense. That's what we should do. Okay, I don't even notice that I'm doing that. But all of a sudden, the people, they're like, I don't know this guy. Am I going to like him? Am I going to hate him? Well, we all seem to relate. I mean, there's some people out there without a sense of humor, but we all kind of like to have humor. Right? And so just breaking the ice by, by, by being a little bit funny, you know, is, is, is a good thing. Having object lessons is a good thing. It doesn't mean you're being a clown or a circus show or something like that. But the main thing is that we have got to make sure that the words that we're teaching or the words that we're preaching or the words that we're exhorting or rebuking or reproving, whatever the case, we're getting those through to the people that we're talking to. And then that is uh, actually when the word is being preached and being effectively preached. Let's pray. Father, 
we thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us to be in the ministry. Each one of us, Lord, can do the work of an evangelist. And I thank, I'm thankful for the men and the women and the children who are willing to do that and happy to do that and, and eager even to do that, to go out and to preach your word. And Lord, sometimes somebody will be called on to preach or to teach. And, uh, and I pray, Lord, that you'll help us have an understanding uh, of how to do that most effectively and help me as a leader to understand some of these things and be able to pass that on and help others uh, to be a little better and more effective in their communicating. And help me, Lord. I know I have a lot to learn in this area, so I pray you help me to do that. We want your word to be communicated. We want your word to get into hearts of the people. And I pray that you help us do that by the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.